Hello, everyone. Sorry for the delay in getting on here. We had some technical difficulties. Um, but let's get started. I'm Whitney Roseboro. I'm one of the marketing coordinators here at Squire. Welcome to our COVID-19 business impact webinar. More on the major provisions of the CARES Act. A couple of items before we begin. Over in the Q&A forum, Sarah, our other marketing coordinator, will include a couple of links for you. The first is if you'd like to sign up for any of our email lists, including our COVID-19 um, informational newsletter. She will also include a link to our COVID-19 relief help request form. You can fill that out to request assistance in any area from our expert um, Squire COVID team. Also, later today, I will send you all of the resources covered in today's webinar via email, as well as details for our upcoming webinars. Now, um, just a couple of introductions. Before we start, we have Megan Bronson helping out in the background today. She will be helping respond to any questions you might have throughout. Just put those in the question and answer forum. Megan is a CPA and an advisory partner at Squire. She earned her Master's of Accountancy from BYU. She has over a decade of experience working with businesses across several industries, specializing in QuickBooks consulting and outsourced accounting services. And our presenter today is Nathan Larson. Nathan is a CPA and wealth advisor for Squire. His focus is financial planning and tax. He enjoys helping his clients with all areas of finance and tax strategies. Born and raised in Utah County, Nathan has a bachelor's degree from Utah Valley University in accounting and a master's of business administration from Utah State University. So Nathan, take it away. Okay, welcome to our webinar today. I'm happy to talk about some of the provisions in the CARES Act. Um, we Last week's webinar, we focused on some of the business relief, specifically the payroll protection program. So um, if we're going to talk about some of the other provisions in the, in the CARES Act. So there's a lot there. It's an 800 and something page um, bill and I've spent over 40 hours reading through it, so hopefully uh, you learned something new that's applicable to you and your life. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started with the PowerPoint, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So welcome. Okay, so today's agenda. Let me just make sure this is working. Okay, here's our agenda today. And uh, I wanted to start out with this quote from Carl Zeiss. And he's a German, so I put the quote in German. But he, Zeiss is an optics company that's been around for a long, long time. And I found this quote. I bought a new pair of binoculars a while ago. And this was the quote that was on there. And I've kind of adopted it as one of my life mottos. But in the accounting industry, especially now, and being a financial planner, there are times like this when we really earn our income or our fees and this quote in english translated to english says this is the moment we work for and so squire has been spending a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to help the community with all of the covid 19 impact and so this is what gets me going every day and we are here to help you so today's agenda we're going to talk about some of the new unemployment benefits we're going to talk about recovery rebates, retirement plan provisions, student loans, and then a few of the business relief provisions that are in the CARES Act. All right, so right off the bat, the CARES Act, a lot of the media and everybody's calling this a stimulus package, and it is that, but really what it is, and with the economy the way it is, it's, it's really a freeze package. The economy was very strong before, you know, COVID-19 hit and then everything had to kind of slow down. And so the CARES Act is designed to freeze the economy so that when we get some sort of containment of the virus, we can get back to, uh, you know, a more normal economic life and business business activity. So, Keep that in mind, it's more of a freeze package just to get the country by until we can get the virus somewhat contained. 
All right, so let's jump into unemployment. Unemployment, there's there was three enhanced benefits with the CARES Act. So benefit one is increased unemployment compensation. So this is an extra federal benefit that's $600 per week on top of regular state unemployment insurance, and it goes, it's available through July 31st, 2020. There's no additional application needed. Everybody who's applying for state unemployment will be in this pool to get this money. Um, according to the state of Utah, some of these benefits have started to pay out uh, last week. And so, you know, the typical state unemployment benefit, I think the average unemployment benefit is $385 per week. It's based on your income. It, you know, unemployment's designed to, to replace 50 to 75% of your, of your regular income. And this is a benefit on top of that. So the $385 per week, somebody would add a $600 per week, um, and this goes through July 31st. And again, this is a federal benefit, so it's part of the CARES Act, but it's paid through and applied for through the state unemployment application, your regular unemployment application. Benefit two is pandemic unemployment assistance. And what this benefit does is two things. One, it, it increases the amount of weeks that somebody can be collecting unemployment benefits. And two, it opens up some unemployment benefits to individuals who typically would not qualify for your traditional unemployment benefits before the, you know, before the CARES Act. So most states, including Utah, allow for 26 weeks of traditional unemployment. And the, the pandemic unemployment assistance pushes that time frame to 30, 39 weeks. And, and it also opens it up for people who traditionally haven't been paying unemployment insurance uh, or who haven't qualified for unemployment benefits. And those are like self-employed individuals or if you've exhausted your regular benefits. And then benefit three is pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. This is a benefit that gives an additional 13 weeks of unemployment, emergency unemployment insurance for individuals who remain unemployed after they have exhausted their traditional benefits. So hopefully it doesn't take that long, but there could be with you know the economic impact, there could be people that need unemployment compensation that long. So those are the three new benefits. Next, I'm going to talk about just kind of how, in general, who's eligible for unemployment benefits, both pre-COVID-19 and then specifically to COVID-19. So in general, to, to be eligible for unemployment, you have to be connected to the workforce long enough. What does long enough mean? It typically means at least five quarters, and that is working in a job that, you know, either your employer's paying unemployment insurance or if you are the employer, if you, you know, if you're a small business and you're employing yourself, that you're paying into the system, the unemployment insurance system with your state. Um, second eligibility requirement would be that you have to, you have to remain able and available for suitable employment. So it's, there's a separate, totally separate program if you become disabled and are unable to work physically or mentally. This is for somebody who lost their job or were laid off for no fault of their own. So, so uh, yeah, if you get laid off or fired, no fault of your own, you're eligible for unemployment benefits. Okay, specifically to COVID-19, um, they've kind of, opened this up a little bit more and and when I say that so if you look at these three bullet points here your uh, your employer temporarily ceased operations with the expectation you will return to work there's lots of companies that that this applies to with employees that are unable to work or they're being furloughed and unemployment the the specific cares act enhancements to unemployment compensation are designed to help in this situation um, you, if you're quarantined but not showing symptoms and you're going to return to work, this is available. If you're able um, and you're not showing symptoms of COVID-19, but your employer is shut down because of or, or is required to be quarantined because of COVID-19, then you can apply for unemployment compensation. And jobs.utah.gov, if you're, if, we might have some out-of-staters here, but if you're in Utah, jobs.utah.gov has all the information. That's where you apply. Um, they're working very, very hard to get everybody 
up to speed and get their application submitted and get payments out. Uh, before COVID-19, in general, like the overall numbers for unemployment, each quarter, the country would see around 100,000 applications. If it was a really busy quarter, it might be up to 200,000 applications. We're just about to hit 6 million, and we might have already hit that, but around 6 million nationwide of new unemployment applications just, just since, since COVID-19. All right, so we're gonna jump over to recovery rebates for individuals. All right, so what these are, are this is, this is a $1,200 advanced tax credit. This is what you hear about in the news all the time about uh, the government's giving everybody money, which they are. This is a $1,200 advanced tax credit per taxpayer with an additional $500 per qualifying child. There is an income stipulation or income limit on this. It's $75,000 of adjusted gross income for somebody single. If you're married filing joint, it's $150,000. If you're head of household, it's $112,500. And once somebody hits the income limitation that's applicable to them, there's a $5 reduction for every $100 of adjusted gross income that's over the, the income limit there. Okay, payments, this is kind of an interesting credit because it's really an advanced 2020 tax credit, but payments are going to be based on your 2019 tax return if you have filed. If you have not filed, then they're gonna look at your 2018 tax return and that's the income limit. They're gonna, they're gonna go and look at what income you reported in 2018 or 2019 if you have filed and that's what they're gonna base your advance on. Then next year, when we start filing 2020 tax returns, the credit's gonna be recalculated. And I had a lot of questions on this saying, oh no, are we gonna have to pay it back if, if our income is higher in 2020? Um, and the answer to that question is no. And even better than that, if you have somebody whose income went down, which that is going to be the case for several, um, then you can you can get your credit or any any missed credit on your 2020 tax return. So and and if you think about that, the reason is this this bill is two two point two trillion dollars. Which I'm I'm a financial planner, so I'm I geek out about the finances all the time. the The U.S. GDP in 2019 was almost 22 million, just under 22 million or 22 trillion. Sorry and and this bill is 2.2 trillion. So 10% of the U.S. you know gross domestic production or product is is in this bill. And Congress had to act quickly. So what was the quickest way and the easiest way for them to get money out? Well, this is one of those ways. And so they're getting the money out. But some some people's income may be higher than these limits, and they may be phased out of the credit based on 2019 or even 2018. And so Congress is providing a way for them to still get this stimulus payment or this advanced tax credit in 2020. All right, now when when are we gonna get the credit? Here, lots of, lots of questions about that. Or when, when do I get my payment? The IRS uh, has started direct deposit payments over the weekend and taxpayers could see deposits as early as uh, tomorrow. I've heard some stories of people seeing those today. Uh, I even saw a story this morning of somebody who had an extra $8.2 million in their bank account. He went to look at his uh, bank, bank activity and saw his balance very high and checked with the bank. And, and as soon as he went to check with the bank, that amount was gone, but he, st but he had received his economic stimulus payment. It, and that's that's assuming that the IRS has your direct deposit information, which the only way they would have that is based on past tax returns. If you've either had refunds direct deposited or if you've had payments electronically taken from your bank account, they'll have that, that account information. Um, if they don't have that information, paper checks will take a lot longer to be issued um the, the irs said that they're not even going to start printing the paper checks until later later this month um so 
is there any way to check on how you know where your where your payment is or if you know which account it's going to go to or anything like that so the irs has been very quick which is is, is interesting for the irs because we're not used to them acting quickly but the irs has been very quick in trying to get things set up so that people can can check their payments um but if you have somebody who's a non-filer, meaning they don't file a tax return because they don't, they're not required to, maybe they're retired and they're only collecting social security or they, they, didn't, they didn't earn enough income to have a, a tax return filing requirement, they're still eligible for payment and they can go to this website here and register to get their, their stimulus payment. And that website's actually live. It, came, it, it became live yesterday. So that's good. And then filers, like regular income tax filers, so if you file the tax return, you can check on your payment. Uh, this is supposed to be coming in mid-April, so it's not live yet, but there's a the same website. There's going to be a link there where you can check on your payment. You can confirm your, your payment type, whether you want direct deposit or paper check, and update your direct deposit information. So, and then this last point here, just just be aware of, of scam artists. Unfortunately, there are people out there who are use, take, trying to use this situation to take advantage of people. And uh, remember that the IRS will never call you. They'll never text, email, or contact you on social media. They always correspond with taxpayers through mail. Once you're working with an IRS agent, then then you might you might be able to contact them through phone or email. But until then, they will never call, they'll never text, they'll never email you. So if you're getting emails that from from scam artists claiming to be IRS agents, it's you know delete those, get rid of those, don't don't respond, don't give them any information. Um, just stay stay safe out there. All right, let's move on to the retirement plan provisions. There are a few here that, that can be helpful. So there's this new coronavirus related distribution. And what this is, is it's an up to $100,000 distribution from retirement accounts that is exempt from the 10% penalty for early withdrawal, which typically applies to somebody who is younger than age 59 and a half. What does it take to qualify for this distribution? You, there's kind of three stipulations. So you have to be diagnosed with COVID-19 or spouse is diagnosed with COVID-19. Or look at this, this statement here in orange. I'm just gonna read it. Experiences adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, furloughed, or laid off, or having work hours reduced, being unable to work due to lack of childcare, closing or reducing hours of a business owned or operated or, or other factors determined by the secretary. So this, this statement here is going to make this available to lots and lots of, of taxpayers if needed. Generally, you know, this is not the best time. It's actually one of the worst times to be taking money out of a retirement plan. But if, you know, if, if you have to do that to, to survive, this is a way that you can do it without having as big of a sting. Along with these distributions, there's also a couple of things um, to, to, to keep in mind and to think through. So the distributions have to take place in 2020. So it's really, um, you know, we got this, this year to do this. And income from the distribution is recognized over a three-year period. So this is, this is really a great benefit because typically if you took out, say you took out the full 100,000 out of your retirement plan, you know, before this this provision, if you were younger than 59 and a half, you'd have a 10% penalty, and on top of the regular income tax that you would you would be paying on that distribution. Well, now they're letting you stretch that income tax over a three-year period if you'd like to. And also on top of that, if you you're able to pay this back into the plan over a three-year period as well. So if you took out the $100,000 and, you know, hopefully things start looking up soon and, and it turns out you didn't need it, you can start to pay that back and you won't have the income tax consequences of taking the distribution. And so that's a very generous uh, provision in there. Um, the next one that I want to talk about is retirement plan loans. 
So, you know, 401k plans, most plans let you borrow against your own balance, you know, borrow money against your own balance from the 401k plan. And the reason why why these are loans are allowed is it, it avoids the income tax consequences and gives 401k participants an emergency place to go get funds if needed. It's, it, you know, I always like to tell people this is a last resort, but it is available. And the new provisions are uh, give you 180 days of these new rules uh, sent from the date of enactment, which is March 27th for, for the CARES Act. So what, what it does is it, it increases the limit from $50,000 to $100,000 of what somebody could borrow. It also increases the amount of their account that they could borrow. So under the old rules, before COVID-19, somebody could borrow up to $50,000 and up to and or up to 50% of their vested balance. What does that mean? Well, if somebody had, let's just say someone had $100,000 in their account, and vested means that it's all, you know, they don't have to work a certain amount of time to to earn it, so to speak. If it's all vested, then that per, that individual could borrow 50,000. If they had 120,000, they'd still be capped at the 50,000. If they had 80,000 in their account, then they would only be able to borrow 40,000 because that's 50% of their balance. Well, now you can borrow up to 100,000 and up to 100% of your vested balance. Now, everybody's 401k plans probably invested in uniquely to their risk tolerance. But with the stock market down, this is not the best place to go to get money because you're essentially locking in stock market losses that, you know, that have, in, that have happened because of the, the COVID-19. And as soon as that, you know, economic activity um, improves and the virus is contained and things get better, then, then those stock prices are going to bounce back. And, and so you don't want to be borrowing and taking out money from retirement plans if you can help it. But these, these provisions are there. And then the last one there, if you have a current outstanding 401k loan, you can defer or delay the payments uh, for up to one year. So that's kind of nice. All right, the, the next retirement plan provision I want to hit on is the waiver, the temporary waiver of required minimum distributions. Required minimum distributions are distributions that apply to someone who is age 72. When you turn 72, the government essentially says you need to start taking out a minimum amount from your retirement accounts and, and pay tax on it, essentially. So this applies, the temporary waiver applies to employer-sponsored retirement plans and individual retirement accounts or IRAs. Um, it includes uh, any 2019 RMDs that would otherwise have to be taken in 2020. That's, that's only going to apply if somebody turned 72 in, in 2019 and there's a tricky rule that lets you postpone your first RMD to the next, till April 15th of the next year. So, so they let you postpone that one if you want. Um, it includes inherited IRAs, which is, which is good. And it also, if somebody's under the five year rule where they're, you know, they, in, they inherit an IRA and they're required to take it out within five years, then that individual can skip the, skip their required minimum distribution for 2020. Um, and then what if I already took my RMD? I have a lot of clients that, that like to take their RMDs at the beginning of the year. And so we pay those out first or second week of January. Um, there is still a 60 day rollover. So what that means is if somebody took, takes their RMD and it, and within 60 days, they, they decide up, oh, I don't, I don't really need that. I want to put that back into my account. Um, they have 60 days to do that without it it counting as income and then keep it if, if it's been longer than 60 days we still have we have we now have this coronavirus related distribution so if somebody really didn't want to take that required minimum distribution for 2020 they could uh if they qualify under the coronavirus distribution they could get that back in there and and save that you know the 2020 year from paying tax on the on the rmd all right, I'm going to jump into student loans. There's a couple provisions with student loans that I want to hit on. 
So first off, there's a six month automatic payment suspension. So if somebody's you know making payments on student loans, now they don't have to for six months. And this is automatic. When the when the first when when they first came out with this, it, it wasn't automatic, and it's now been clarified to be an automatic payment suspension. So that means if you've got automatic payments going toward a federal student loan, they're going to stop for six months, and interest will not be accrued during that six month period. Um, so if you still want to make your payments, you'll need to work with your your borrower. Um, to keep those payments going and it will essentially just reduce your principal. It, it's only av applicable for federal student loans and uh, so it's kind of a nice a nice benefit just to just to help people's budget during this tough time. Okay, the the other cool thing with student loans that's in the CARES Act is this uh, employer employer payment of of uh, education expenses which now has been added, they've added student loans as applicable education expenses. So under already existing laws and rules, we, you know, an employer can pay up to $5,250 for an employee's education costs. And that payment is not includable in the employee's income, but it's still a deduction for the employer. That's current law, that's still there, still available. What the CARES Act does is says, okay, you can now use that same amount if you want to, to pay directly on an employee's student loan before uh, year end, and that will not count as employee's income. So great, great benefit. I don't hear of too many people using the even the education assistance, but this is a really good way to pay your employees more it, um, without having them with, reducing their tax impact and also reducing your employee employment tax impact. So if this applies to you, I would say try and utilize this, you know, as you can. All right, we are at 1140. So I wanted to get done in about 40 minutes, which with the delay, we probably will. Um, Business relief. As I said when we started, last week's webinar talked a lot about the payroll protection program. So we're not going to talk about that. We'll try and answer questions if you have specific questions about that. We'll try and answer that at the end. But some of the other business relief provisions I do want to talk about. So there is, with the CARES Act, there is an employee retention credit. This is a credit um, for the employer against the employer's share of the Social Security taxes or the FICA taxes, the 6.2%. Um, and how the credit works is it's limited to 50% of employee wages each quarter with an annual cap of $10,000 per employee. It, it It is refundable if you have um, excess excess credits above what your your tax payment would be normally. And you can apply for that refund on using Form 7200. It's a brand new form. And this credit applies starting, we just got guidance on this. Um, it might've been early this week or, or towards the end of last week. This credit is going to start applying on quarter two. So quarter two just started April 1st. Um, employment taxes are going to be accruing. You can, it, um, you can, essentially get this credit. But the a couple caveats, the if you're if you're getting a PPP, you know, if you're part of that payroll protection program or the emergency injury disaster loan, then you're not going to be eligible for this credit. So up at the top, I forgot about this. Up at the top I wrote who cares about the employee retention credit when you can get a, a you know, when you can apply for the payroll protection program. Really it's going to be the one the employers who don't get the PPP, this, this credit might be beneficial to them. Um, as far as qualification goes, you to qualify a business has to be partially suspended by government order due to, due to COVID-19 during the calendar, or they have to have a, a reduction of gross receipts um, of at least 50% 50 50 or more when com for the quarter when compared to the quarter in tw in the prior year. And then once they've hit that for a quarter, they're eligible each quarter going forward for 2020 until their gross receipts go above 80% um, 
of uh, of gross receipts for a comparable quarter in 2019. And then w- once that, if they do go over that 80 percent, then they wouldn't they'd they'd qualify for that quarter. But then after after that quarter, they would not qualify. All right, payroll tax deferral. This is a a really good. Essentially, this is a free loan from uh, the government. You can employers can and this applies to every every employer, but and including self-employed. Pay, you can delay your payment of the same the same tax, the Social Security 6.2 percent payroll tax, the employer share, can be deferred for quarters two through four. And what that means is when are you gonna you're still gonna have to pay the taxes, but now you get to pay half of your deferred taxes. Um, on December 31st, 2021, and then you get to pay the other half on a year later on December 31st, 2022. And if you're self, if you're self-employed, individuals are allowed to delay the the 50% portion of SE tax by short paying their quarterly estimated tax payments. And and we haven't. I'm guessing they're not going to charge penalties for underpaying. It, um, this is going to be built into the, the calculation of underpayment penalties in some way. And this, this applies to all employers regardless of size. Also, one, one area of confusion with the payroll protection program, this deferral is available even up until you receive loan forgiveness under the, the PPP. So, and, and this is going to start on payments for second quarter. So employers that are paying that are required to pay payroll taxes uh, more often, they're they're going to want to figure this out and essentially defer paying if if they want to the 6.2 percent employer share of those. And that on the second quarter form 941, there'll be a place to 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 note that. And then I don't know how the the repayment's going to go, but this, you, you know employers are going to want to be mindful of that so it doesn't hit them hit them surprisingly or, or that they don't so they don't forget to to make the payments when those when those payment dates come due. As soon as a business does get loan forgiveness from the PPP, they still get the deferral on the taxes that have that they've been deferring up until that point. They just won't get any deferral. They won't be a bit, uh, they won't be able to defer the future payroll taxes from the from the point of a loan forgiveness. All right, so a couple more business relief provisions and then we'll jump into Q&A. There is some net operating loss uh, modifications. So the, you know, back when the Trump tax law was passed, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we got rid of the NOL carrybacks. Now now we've got them back. So we've got a five-year carryback that's required for 2018, 2019, and 2020 if you have a net operating loss. It, you can elect out, but I did want to make sure that people know that is required. So if you don't make an election, then you're required to carry back a loss rather than carry it forward. Um, the the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the Trump law, limit, limited NOL deductions in a, in a year to 80% of taxable income. Well, that's now gone for 2018, 19, and 2020. And, and if you notice those dates... <laughs> 2018 tax returns have most likely already been filed, and so what do we, how do we elect out of a required carryback provision on a tax return that's already done and filed? Well, you can forego the required carryback of 2018 and 2019 by filing a statement with your 2020 tax return. So that's when you need to make the election to carry that. You know, if you don't want to carry it back to make the election out and uh, carry the loss forward. If you do want to carry the loss back, that's going to mean you have to do one of two things. You have to file an amended tax return, the the loss back on 2018, or if you do it before June 30th of 2020, you can file a for a quick refund claim. And quick, uh, if you could see me, I would be putting imaginary quotation marks. These don't I've never seen one of these come quickly. They're they're kind of a hassle to do the the NOL carrybacks, but Squire can help you if if that's the right course of action for you. If you're if you incur a loss in 2019 or 2020, 
um, we can help with the carry back if uh, we can at least do an analysis to see what the what the appropriate course of action would be for you. I think that's it. So I did want to uh, leave with a positive quote here by Warren Buffett. I am an eternal optimist and I know that we're gonna get through this, this pandemic and all the economic impacts. I, I'm, I'm mindful of people who are hurting and I, you know, we're all going through some sort, we're, we've all been impacted in some way or another. But keep in mind, this is the United States of America, and this is what Warren Buffett said several years ago about, about the U.S. economy. He said, we have a system that unleashes human potential. We will have interruptions. We overshoot and undershoot sometimes, but your kids and your grandkids will live better than you. So we will get through this. It's, you know, it's, it's tough right now, but there is light at the end of the tunnel, and Squire's here to help, but we'll all get through this together. And things will get back to, to normal at some point. And, and these provisions are here to kind of, like I said, we just try to, free, the government's trying to freeze the economy so that we can get through this tough period and then we'll, you know, things will start improving again. So with that, I'll uh, open it up for question and answer. So, okay, so Megan, if you have a question, type it into the, the chat the meeting chat or the con the question answer section, and we'll try to answer these. Uh, Megan said that, okay, so never, I'm not gonna read that one. Um, what qualifies for PPP, subchapter S, payments, 1099, et cetera? Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of going back to the presentation we did on last week, but I'll answer that. So yes, S corporation would definitely qualify. Really, you have to have payroll to qualify or be self-employed. Uh, so the self-employed applications were supposed to open up last Friday. I don't think we've gotten really good guidance on what income it's supposed to replace, but my guess would, and it, what would make most sense to me would that it is that it would be your, your net self-employment income um, probably I would start with 2019. That might give you an idea on how much uh, you might qualify for a payroll protection program. Um, there was a question here that says, can, un can employee get unemployment from another part-time job while being included in our payroll protection loan? So the answer to that question is it depends. They would they could definitely apply for unemployment insurance with the state. They will have to disclose any other income that they are earning currently, and then the state will decide based on the rules there what um, what kind of, you know, how much of a benefit, if any, they would be available to claim. Um, hey, Megan, do you want to jump in and do the three minute deep dive on the answer to the PPP question? Or do you want to do that at the end? Um, let's let's go through. Can you talk to that payroll tax? Clarify the payroll tax question. Oh, yeah. Um, and I don't know that I know the answer to this one, but here's the question. Um, the one piece that I still lack good understanding is the tax credit. We already have an employee who qualified for emergency sick leave. So we need really clear guidance by the 15th about what to do with our federal tax deposit. The amount we would pay would be less than the tax liability tracked in QuickBooks. If we have, a, if we have paid out in the, any emergency sick leave or paid FMLA leave. Okay, so this question is referring, I'm, I'm assuming they're referring to the first bill that was passed um, by Congress specifically in increasing sick leave and requiring employees to, to pay for sick leave. Um, and I, I don't have a good answer on that question, but we can get back to you on that. Um, and I think on, the, on, that, on that tax credit, if you are applying for the PPP, I don't think you're eligible to claim that credit. So keep that in mind. Um, okay, here's another question. Please address what happens if we have already laid people off. How will that affect our repayment of the loan? Also, if we are intended to lay 
intending to lay someone off next week after filing for a, a PPP. So the the amount of the loan that, that a company is going to get should be based, will most likely be based on 2019 payroll. So it, it probably won't affect how much of a loan you qualify for. Where it will have an impact is on the loan forgiveness side because the in order to qualify for the complete loan forgiveness, the employers are going to have to keep essentially the same number of full-time equivalent employees by July by July 30, 31st. And so if you you know if you reduce your workforce, you're likely going to have a reduction of the forgivable amount of the PPP. Um, and one more question. If a larger company owns more than a 50% share of our company, do we need to add their employees to ours when we check to see if we have less than 500 employees? Does it matter if the larger company is a foreign company? The answer to that question is yes. Any any owner of more than 20%, you have to aggregate. And so if there's more than, you know, if, if if your company has less than 500 employees, but when you add the employees of the owner, the, uh, the owner, you know, from other act business activities, then yes, you probably aren't going to qualify if you if you go over the 500 employee limit. I think that Megan, is that all the questions we have? Yep, that is. So none, no new ones have come in. Please go ahead and shoot them in if you need. I'm going to, since we have a, a few minutes, I'm going to take a second and um, go through a, a deep dive that I um, that I've been working on and we um, we have kind of gotten it ready to be published out there and we're gonna get it out on our website today um, so you guys get the first look at it Nathan can you, oh yeah that looks good okay looks like we're good so this is our um, we created a flow chart to help you decide how the PPP program applies to you. Um, two principles of this um, that Nathan kind of hit on the the first one that either you have wages that you're trying to get a loan for um, or you have self-employment tax that is your take home. You've recorded it as sub, as income subject to self-employment tax on your personal return. And the other thing with this flowchart is that you've already determined that you qualify as an eligible small business. So the over 500 employees um, with exceptions as well as the affiliate rules were those are we're, we're assuming that you've handled that before digging into this flow chart. So the first question you're going to have to ask yourself is what income tax form do you use to report your self employed earnings? And so if you think of yourself as self-employed, um, how do you how do you report that from a tax perspective? So you could be on a C-Corp, you could be an S-Corp, a partnership or an individual. And some people are like, well, I'm an LLC, so what am I? And so uh, likely you would be a partnership if you have multiple owners in your LLC or if you're by yourself, your LLC is on your individual return as a Schedule C. And so that's noted here. If you elected to be taxed as an S Corp, then that would be an LLC could be here in the S Corp side. Um, and then we have some other considerations to, to note later. Okay, so if um, if you're filing as a C Corp, first, do you, play, do you pay W-2 employees? If you do, then yes, you're gonna file a business PPP application. If you do not, then there is nothing for the owners because the owners are not going to have anything to do with self-employment tax and on a C-Corp. And so there would not be anything except for to pay employees. If you're an S-Corp, um, if you do not pay employees, then there's nothing to do either because S-Corp earnings are not taxed as self-employment earnings on your personal return. So the owners are not going to get anything here, but usually the owners are paid through W-2s. So if you have employees, even if it's just the owners, you would pay, you would be able to file for a PPP loan um, here on the, uh, on the business application side. You would include owner's pay, that's allowed, 
to have the owner's W-2 pay included in your calculation. Um, if you do not have to pay the owners, then you'll file using just employee wages. So that's an S Corp uh, rundown. Um, brace yourself for the next slide. It's a little more, little more in depth because as a 1065, you have twofold going on. First, um, that means there's multiple owners. So first you look at it from the, the business side. Do you pay W-2 employees? If you do not, then the owners need to go do an owner analysis over here. But if you do pay W-2s, you're going to find out, well, are you paying the owners as well? And if you are, then just do a business one for W-2 wages, including owners, and you're good. If you do not do pay the owners, then you'll still do the business application with normal employees, but each owner will need to decide whether they qualify to file on their own. You come over to the owner analysis. The question is all that matters is, is the income from this business subject to self-employment tax? And if the answer is yes, then you're going to file a self-employed a self-employed application using net earnings from self-employment, which we'll define on page eight. If this income is not subject to self-employment tax, then you will not do anything personally. The business can still file for the wages, but you personally will not file. And then if you report on a Schedule C on your personal return, or if you just get 1099s and you don't have any deductions, so you report it on your personal, personal return, if you mark that box um, that there's self-employment, that it's subject to self-employment on your on your return, which a Schedule C is, then you're going to file with net earnings from self-employment. If you pay employees as if you're the sole owner and you pay employees, then you can do them in one application as a self-employed. You use your net earnings from self-employment and then you add in the employee payroll costs as well. We'll get to those. Um, we'll get to those in a few in, in, in the next slide here. So again, we started with how do you file those self-employed earnings? And that kind of is going to determine the, the path you'll go. So here's how here's net earnings from self-employment. Um, these are specific boxes. This is these are both versions of the Schedule C. That's the bottom line after uh, expenses for using your home office, after mileage deductions, after uh, depreciation, all these things that may or may not be in your accounting or QuickBooks that you do deduct the, these extra personal expenses and then that's the number that's going to get used for self-employment purposes. Each of these lines here, which the Schedule K-1s, and notice they're just from 1065s, um, if you're getting a K-1 from them, it'll note whether you're a material participant or not, and that will determine whether you're subject to self-employment tax. This other income, that's your 1099s that have no costs against them. All of these lines flow through to the Schedule SE, line two. And then you will be limited to 100, 100 grand annually per person. So that limitation is already there for employees, and we're going to make that limitation on the that um, self-employed filing as well. So whatever you, whatever that SE line, schedule SE line two is, take it to a hundred grand um, limit. Um, one thing to note is that each of these schedule C's or schedule K's are noted to be assigned to a taxpayer, which means that. If each spouse is um, self-employed, you could each file for your own 100K limit um, based on what you each have. You each will have a Schedule SE um, on your returns in 2019. Um, basically, you take the, the calculation over here. I, I'll let it you know, look through it. I'm not going to go into a bunch of details here because that's not the purpose of the call and I want to wrap us up. But um, just note that forgiveness for self-employed is still to be determined. We are still waiting on guidance from the Treasury. Um, we keep thinking it'll happen any minute now. We've been holding our breath for you know five days and still nothing has come through. Um, they're not in super um, they're not in a super rush because very few people have received funds and 
none of those people who receive funds are self-employed because they all just got in the queue as of earliest Friday. So they're not super, um, they're not super rushed on this. Hopefully any minute though, still we'll find out the details on that forgiveness side. Um, and then the last page is just a little thing, you know, things you ought to be ready to provide as you do your application, if you haven't already. So we are going to put this up on our website. I think what we'll make sure is that when Sarah sends out the recorded webinar, we'll make sure she attaches this as well or sends a link to our website of where this document is so that you can use it at, as you as you need. Um, but I just want to that's all I want to cover right now. I'll wrap it up back to you, uh, Nathan or Whitney. Hey, thank you everyone. Have a great day and a good week.